Praise him, all ye people, for his merciful kindness is great towards us, and the truth of the Lord endureth forever. Praise ye the Lord. Shall we stand together? Father and our God, we are so thankful that you have spared our lives and allowed us to come to the house of prayer one more time. We pray that you warm our hearts with your spirit as we lift your name in praise. Bless all of those that are assembled with us. Bless each household. Continue to pour out your mercy and your grace. Draw us by the power of your spirit closer together. Teach us how to love one another as ye have loved us. Bless us and make us a blessing. Use us to thine own glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Our opening selection.
God we serve. Our responsive reading today is our church covenant, and we will read together. Having been led as we believe by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we do now in the presence of God, angels in this assembly, most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit, to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge and holiness, to give it a place in our affection, prayers, and services above every organization of human art, to sustain its wishes, ordinances, discipline, and doctrine, to contribute cheerfully and regularly as God has prospered us towards his expenses for the support of a faithful and evangelical ministry among us, the relief of the poor, the spread of the gospel throughout the world. In case of difference of opinion in the church, we will strive to avoid a contentious spirit, and if we cannot unanimously agree, we will cheerfully recognize the right of the majority to go. We are also engaged to maintain family and secret devotion, to study diligently the word of God, to religiously educate our children, to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances, to walk circumspectly in the world, to be kind and just to those in our employ, and faithful in the service we promise others, enduring in the purity of heart and goodwill towards all men, to exemplify and command our holy faith. We further engage to watch over, to pray for, to exhort and stir each other unto every good word and work. Guard each other's reputation, not needless exposing the infirmities of others, to participate in each other's joys, and with tender sympathy, bear one another's burdens and sorrows cultivate Christian courtesy, to be slow to give or take offense, but always ready for reconciliation, being mindful of the rules of the Savior in the 18th chapter of Matthew, to secure it without delay, and through life, amid evil report and good report, to seek to live to the glory of God, who hath called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. When we remove from this place, we engage as soon as possible to unite with some other church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. Amen. Amen. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thine holy name. Father, as we come on this first Sunday, we hear the birds singing. We see the trees budding, all of a sign of new life and new beginning. And we pray today, Father, that you will renew us also. Dust us off and start us anew. We realize here in Sorrow Valley, sometime we are stumbling and falling. 
But we pray that through the power of your spirit that you would dust us off and start us anew. We come confessing our sins and our transgressions. Praying that you would strengthen us where we're weak and build us where we are torn down and grant us a closer walk with you each and every day of our lives. We're living in turbulent times, Lord. Satan is busy everywhere. Rumors of war. Viruses throughout the world. Trouble on every side. But Father, remind us that your grace is sufficient to carry us through. Teach us how to continue to look to the hills from which cometh our help. Remembering that our help comes from thee and thee alone. Must Jesus bear the cross alone? And all the world go free. But if there's a cross, then there's a cross for me. We pray that you will bless our church and our church family, wherever they are today. Some are struggling with sickness and trouble. Nursing homes are running over. Hospitals are full. But, oh God, we pray that you continue to guide us from one good degree of grace to the other. Those that are sick and don't think that they will ever be well again, we pray that you would touch them with your power. Let them know that it is well with their soul. Bless our pastor in a special way. Bless his family as he goes in and out before us, as he leads us to higher heights and deeper depths in Christ Jesus. Remember all of these workers in the vineyard. We pray that you will bless them in a special way. And then, Father, when it is that that time comes that this place can furnish us a home any longer, meet us somewhere down by the chilly Jordan and save us to yourself. Carry us safely to the other side where every day will be Sunday and the Sabbath will have no end. Grant these petitions in the mighty name of Jesus and God's people said, Amen.
a faithful God. His name is faithful. People know that our God is faithful. Anybody here know that God is faithful today? And the reason why you know it is because you've experienced His goodness, His mercy, and His love. It's good to see you today, and thank you for choosing to worship with us. We thank this wonderful aggregation of singers today who come to give God the glory and the praise to his holy name through song. We thank you for cho choosing to, to dial in and to uh, be with us today as we uh, try to celebrate uh, the goodness of our Lord and Savior. Uh, today's our text will come from the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of St. Matthew, the 20th chapter, and we lift up these verses, the 20th through the 27th verse. You may scroll with me if you have your cell phones today, or you can walk the verses with me if you have your Bibles. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? She said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand and the other on the left, in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with a baptism? that I am baptized with, they say unto him, We are able. And he said unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand or my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. For just a few moments, I ask that you pray with me and pray for me as I preach from this subject, serving God's people with excellence. Serving God's people with excellence. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for uh, another day's journey. We thank you, God, that you Woke us up this morning with our minds stayed on Jesus. 
And we ask God that somehow you will be in our midst, God. We live in a virtual world, God, but we know that you are always present with us and that there's nothing that can separate us from you. And so, God, we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, and we ask, God, that you would have your way in this worship experience, and God, have your say in this sermonic moment, God, that the words in my mouth and the meditations in my heart will be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Serving God's people with excellence. Many times in the world today, we see people who get ahead in life because of family relationships. It happens in every arena of life. During the last presidency, we saw the president elevate his daughter to a high appointed position in government, even though there were laws on the book that were passed to prohibit nepotism in the federal government. He even went so far as to appoint his son-in-law to a lofty position and did an end around the security <laughs> clearances in order to do what he wanted to do. We see the same uh, 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 machinations, if you will, in our fair state. We see people who are able to win high offices running on the coattails of their daddy's name. And this extends over into the judicial branch as well. In many of our counties, judgeships are handed down as a matter of family right. They pass down from generation to generation, from grandfathers to, to fathers to sons and now to daughters. And now even from, from daughters down to grandsons and granddaughters, almost as though it was a matter of birthright. In business, it is a common practice to see family members leapfrog to the top of the businesses that were established by family members or in which the families have been involved for long periods of time. Not even our courthouses are immune from this type of patronage system. For many of the uh, persons employed in the clerk's office, uh, their daddies and their mamas have been in the clerks before them. <laughs> and most of us know that we live in a world uh, that sometimes is more important uh, who you know than what you know. You so, have, so many times advancement is not based on merit. Now, you know, everybody talks about we prefer a merit-based system, but so many times advancement or going up in the world is a matter of who you know and plain old favoritism. Anybody know what I'm talking about today? It is, however, a natural inclination to want to see someone that you love and care about advance early in life. People will go to great extremes in order to see their loved ones elevated in life. And they are not above calling in a favor or two. <laughs> Is there anyone who's ever seen that happen in your life? You saw someone promoted to a position simply because of what their name was. You saw someone elevated in life because of a family relation or friendship even though perhaps they were not the best person suited for the job. All of us have experienced this type of occurrence in our lives. And many times there was not anything that we could do or say. The job description may have specified that the person uh, to fill that job must have certain qualifications. But all of a sudden, the job qualifications were taken down <laughs> and they were rewritten because they wanted to promote who they wanted to promote, even though the person didn't have the qualifications. So they rewrote the job descriptions. Not surprisingly, uh, churches can have the same problems. There are times when churches can fall into the same fallacy. They have people whose daddy may be, daddy may be preacher, and even though the son or daughter may not be called, they determine that they're going to pass to the church. They can choose, and sometimes even churches themselves choose and select and elect persons to positions not because they are the best qualified, but because of family ties or familiarity. These social promotions may be common in the world, but they are not in accord with the standards and the ways of God. In our text uh, today, Salome, the mother of James and John, who were the sons and children of Zebedee, Along with her two sons, 
she goes to have a talk with Jesus. Now, she doesn't go to tell him all about her troubles, however. You need to know that some scholars believe that Salome was the sister of Mary, who is Jesus' mother. If this is true, then James and John were Jesus' kinfolk, y'all. This mother and her two sons come and make and ask a favor of Jesus. She asks that the, her two sons be allowed to sit one on the right hand and the other on the left hand side of Jesus when he comes into his kingdom. Now you need to know and you need to understand, get this, Jesus has just promised all 12 of his disciples, he says this, Verily I say unto you that you which follow me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you shall also sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. In other words, they're going to be rulers over many. They are going to be rulers and everybody's going to be, have, a, have a throne, y'all. That each one's going to have a throne. Now, we're we just trying to get a crown. But he said they're going to have a throne. Jesus also promises, he's already promised that each and every one of the disciples would be rulers with him. But this isn't enough. James and John and their mama have got a, a plan, a scheme. They already go, are part of a select number. There are only 12 disciples, y'all. Twelve disciples, many followers, but twelve chief disciples, and yet they have the mentality of the world that they were raised up in because, see, they just are new to the kingdom, and they bring the culture and the world with them into the church of the living God, and they want the church to operate in the same way that they have seen the rulers of the world exercise dominion and authority. We do know that's how the world works, don't we? When legislatures draft laws not to make sure that the electorate or the elections are fair, but rather they can tilt the scales so that only they can be elected and the persons that look like them can be chosen, uh, then this is an abuse of authority. When legislatures ignore the dictates of the state that they have been elected to serve and of the people that they've been elected to serve and even the nation's constitutions because they want to have it their way irrespective of the state constitution or United States constitution and what they may require, then they are exercising an abuse of their powers and of their dominion and of their authority and there is wrong, it is wrong, it is wrong. When legislatures pass laws so they can disavow the will and the vote of the people of any state simply because their candidate loses, then we see an abuse of the exercise of power. And when legislators refuse to, pu to fund public schools properly and adequately and siphon away dollars that should be going to the public schools to segregated institutions uh, simply because they can and they have billions of dollars of surplus funds. It is an abuse of exercise of power and authority and it's wrong, it's wrong, it's wrong. They elevate themselves at the expense of our children and our children's children. The rulers in Jesus' day ruled with the same abusive practices of political, economic, social, and military power. Just like we're seeing over in Russia today, when Russia takes and puts 150,000 troops and surrounds a neighbor on three sides, and then, uh, you know, under false pretenses, under false colors, invades a nation simply because it's a power grab. It is abuse of authority. It is abuse of military power. And it is wrong. It is wrong. It is wrong. Anytime people in power look out for their own selfish interests at the expense of others, and they try to do so regardless of what institution it may be, because they want to maintain the status quo. It's wrong, 
it's wrong and it's wrong. The mother and this mother and son have just heard Jesus tell his disciples that, you know, wait a minute, get this now, that he's about to suffer. Jesus has just given them a confession of his impending suffering, death, and shame. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He tells them that the Son of Man shall be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and that they will condemn him to death, that he'll be delivered to the Gentiles to be mocked, to be scourged, to be beaten, to be crucified. And on the third day, he will rise again, and they don't understand a word he says. They don't comprehend. You know why they can't understand? Because <laughs> they're, they're wrapped up in themselves. It's because they have small packages. It's because somewhere, uh, even as they were engaging in the acts of discipleship and a ministry, it hadn't been about the ministry. It's been all about them. It's been all about what they want. It's been all about what they can get. It's been all about what's in it for them. And they are looking out for their own selfish interests. They want to elevate themselves at the expense of others. And, and, they, and wait a minute, wait a minute. Who said they were, they were the best qualified? Who said that they were the best qualified? to sit on the right and on the left-hand side of the master. You know, this, this is self-promotion <laughs> to an extreme, isn't it? They want to elevate their position in life. They want to be lifted up. They want to be exalted as chief rulers of the kingdom. It's not enough for them to be rulers or equals in God's kingdom. This mother and sister, this mother and her two sons, come to Jesus seeking social promotion because of family connections. They do not understand that this is not the way of God's kingdom. Jesus listens to this request and their request, and he tells them that they don't even know what they're asking. <laughs> Have you ever seen people like that? <laughs> they ask a question because somebody else puts them up to it, and they don't even know what it is that they've been put up to, but they've been selected. You know, some, some, it happened to some of us when we were younger. You know, somebody dared you to go ask some question because they knew what was going to happen if the question got asked, and they didn't want to get in trouble, but they wanted to put you up there, and you go up and ask the question, your head gets chopped off. You're the one that gets punished. You're the one that gets held in account. It's not enough for them. They do not understand the ways of the kingdom of God. They see the glory but they don't understand the suffering. Yeah, they, they, they don't have a clue as to what it means to truly be a ruler in the kingdom of God. Do you know it costs something to serve God? Do you understand that it's not all about, you know, that's what many people, many people like to, they like to, to be chosen. They like to be elevated. They like to be, you know, seen. But, you know, that's just part of the work. You know, what, the work begins after you get in the position. The work is, is, is when everybody else is, is nobody watching you. That's when the work has to be done. And so they, they see the glory, but not the suffering. They don't know what comes with being lifted up. Elevation in God's in kingdom or God's empire is not based on worldly standards of favoritism or even family relationships. Jesus rejects the world's way of doing things and says to these, these disciples, these church folks, to sit on my right or my left is not mine to give, but it should be given to them for whom it is prepared of my Father. Now, do you know the other disciples were not happy when they heard what this mother and her two sons had done? The Bible says that when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. In other words, they were upset, y'all. Anyone ever heard the term righteous indignation? You, you were justifiably upset when you heard about something that someone had done. It may have been underhanded even. I was watching a movie uh, the other night, and in this movie, this law firm partner had passed off work to an associate. <laughs> now, now, get this, the, the partner, really, he was lazy. He didn't do any work anyway, but he would take credit for all the work the associate did. It was a family law firm, 
And so, you know, his daddy had, had brought these two boys into the law firm. And so, of course, they would write, write in daddy's coattails. We just talked about that. And, uh, but they wasn't doing the work. Now, they had this brilliant associate, and they were both of the sons. Both of the sons were dumping the work on this young man. And the young man was, had to stay there all kinds, all night long. Couldn't do much. Had, look, his social life was nil. And then, get this, after he had done the research, he said, you know, the, the, the partner knew he didn't know enough about the subject matter, so they wanted him to sit in with the client, right? And when he sits in with the client, what happens is the client asks a question, and it stumps the partner, right? So the partner has to go over there, and, and, and the associate, being a good associate, he, he, he gives the, the answer to the partner. He answers the question, and then, the, then the, here's the partner there. The partner says, well, you know, that's what I told him. <laughs> now, if this young associate <laughs> had, had, had not wanted to keep his job, if this young associate didn't have bills to pay, you know, he would have had righteous indignation. Jesus is aware of the conflict that the actions of this mother and her two sons has caused among disciples. His cause in the church, y'all. Is it all right if I say church? So Jesus conducts an on-the-spot workshop. Jesus calls them together and says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles, now you need to understand the word Gentiles is talking about the pagans, y'all. In other words, Jesus said, you know that the rulers in the, of the world, they lord it over you know, their subjects. They lord it over those who are underneath them. And those who are great in the world exercise authority over them. But it is not, shall not be so among you. Not so. That's not the way the church operates. That's not the way of the community of faith and the people of God operate in my church and in God's kingdom. But whosoever, the whosoever means anybody, but everybody, anyone, but whosoever will be great among you. Uh, Jesus gives a litmus test and he says, let him be your minister. Now, he's not talking about the preacher, y'all. He's not talking about that. But well, the word minister here means servant. He let him be your servant. And whosoever desires to be chief, whosoever desires to be first, must first of all be willing to be your servant. Let him be your servant, y'all. You know, you know, we used to read, y'all remember Otis was pastoring and for much of, before COVID, I would always share on the first Sunday the poem Others. And, and because this is what Jesus says. He says, don't, you know, it's about others. It's about subordinating your selfish interests so that you promote the interest and the well-being of the church and the interest and you are willing to, to humble yourself to bow down and to serve others. Jesus says the more you're willing to serve others, the greater you will be. In other words, greatness, leadership, and rule in the church are defined by service and by ministry. Can I say that again? Greatness, leadership, and rule in the church are defined by two things service, and by ministry. Now notice that nowhere did it say by committees or by boards. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. By service and by ministries. What Jesus says is that whosoever, that means you and you and you and you and you, whoever, whichever one of us who desires to be great, we can be great if we are willing to humble ourselves and serve God's people. Instead of using people, we are to serve them. Instead of lording over people, we are to serve them. Instead of advancing our own selfish agendas and interests and causes and, and, and even <laughs> grudges, we ought to let God have his way. That's who the church belongs to, isn't it? Servant leaders appreciate each other's worth. Servant leaders realize it's not about us. Servant leaders realize that it's all about Jesus. 
Servant leaders realize it's not about what we want, but the question that we need to be asking ourselves is, what does God want? We need to ask the question, what would Jesus do? What is it that God and his son, who God sent to the earth, to the earth, to the world, that it might be saved, what is it that they desire for the church to do in a times like these, in the present generation, in the 21st century? Servant leaders realize that they are not above any job. Lord have mercy. Did y'all hear that? There is not any job too big or too small. I better start with the one, too small. Because some people, there's some people won't serve unless they, they, you know, they, they got the big title. There's some people who won't do anything unless they're in charge of the committee or they're in charge of the project. But, you know, a true servant is willing to do the small things. We've kind of talked about that in our five-star church Bible study, haven't we? We talked about, you know, if, 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 if these trash needs to be picked up, and you out here, you a member of the church, pick the trash up. Don't wait for the custodian to come to work later in the day, you know, when the church, people ride by the church, see the trash out there, you already at the church. If you are serving, then you pick the trash up. If you need some gloves, come in, I'll give you gloves. But we're talking about true servants. True servants are willing to get things done. True servants, a servant, really great servants, you know what they do? They actually get things done. There's so many people in the church and in, a, in every organization, and all they do is talk. They talk a good game. It's kind of like the athletes. With some of y'all were athletes, boy. Some people they they, they, they good as long as the game hadn't started. <laughs> As long as they're on the sideline, they were the best player. But you put them out there in the game, and they freeze up. And the coach had to take them out and put them back on the bench because they couldn't play the game. They couldn't compete. Good servants, servant leaders, are willing to roll up their sleeves. They're willing to do the hard things. They're willing to work while it's still day. For the night cometh when no man worketh. Servant leaders... Take the initiative. Lord have mercy. Can I say that again? They take the initiative. In other words, when they have the organization under their wings of leadership, uh, their ministries, uh, they are the leaders of ministries, they don't have to wait for the pastor to say, uh, you know, it's time for your ministry to act. <laughs> it's not time for your ministry to function. They take the initiative because they, uh, they have a passion for the work and they have a love of the church and the church members, but most of all, they have a love for the cause of Christ. And so they serve just like Jesus serves. Jesus actually is our model of service. If you look to the 28th verse, Jesus tells us how great leaders serve. Jesus says, serve God's people just as the Son of Man does. The Son of Man doesn't come to be waited upon. He doesn't come to be served. Anybody ever gone to the country club? Or anybody gone to one of the fancy restaurants? What are they call Five Star? Or what, what, what? Yeah, Five Star, aren't they? I guess, you know, you go, this, uh, you go in there, boy, you, when you get there, they got, they got the, the, the napkins on the table and the fine cloth and fine china. And, and Lord, look, you can't hardly sit down. Would you like some water? Would you like, and then you, is it, you want an appetizer? Do you need some bread? And before you can get that, are you ready to place your order? I mean, they, they just, it looks, they anticipate your needs. They're there. You don't have to call them. You don't have to raise your hand up and try to flag them down because they're about service. The Son of Man comes not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I need to know today, is there anyone here today who's willing to become that kind of servant leader? Is there anyone here today who's willing to, to put aside your own selfish 
agendas, your own selfish uh, interests, what you want, what you desire, but you're willing to, to, to do what God wants. And you're willing to serve the way uh, that Jesus says that we ought to serve him. If you're willing to be that type of servant leader, as the choir sings, we invite you to come because you will be one who serves God's people with excellence. Don't you want to come today? Won't you be uh, to, a, a willing servant, a humble servant, a kind servant, a servant who understands that it's not about us, but it's all about Jesus. The doors of the church are open today. If there's a man, a woman, a boy, or girl, and you've been searching for the living God, today is your day. If you want to be a better Christian, you may have already, you may already be in the church, but today you have an opportunity to become of the church. You have an opportunity to be the real church. Won't you fall in love with Jesus today? Won't you fall in love with the ways of Jesus and become a servant of the living God? If you would like to join the church today and you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook, then we invite you to reach out to us. You can call us at 336-272-1166 or you may email us at shilohcares, S-H-I-L-O-H, cares at gmail.com, and we will receive you into this branch of Zion, into the body of Jesus Christ. No place. Won't you come? It's not too late. Won't you come? Amen. Can you just give God a hand clap today? Can you thank God for his grace and his mercy? And we thank God for this wonderful congregation, an aggregation of singers. We thank God for Jessica over there on the drums and representing 1891. That's not her age, y'all. And then, of course, we thank you for Reverend Annette and by our audiovisual team and for each and every one of you, for Reverend Parker, but most of all, we thank God for you, because without your presence, our worship service would not have been what it has been. And as we move forward in the worship service, there's still one more act of worship that you can be a part of, and that is the worship of giving. Has anybody been blessed by God? Has God given you more than you really deserve? If you are standing at number, and that's where all of us are, in our, in our, you know, if we weigh things in our lives, then you would not uh, 
think it robbery to give to God a portion of what God has given unto you. You know, God challenges us, but God doesn't want us to do anything that we're not willing to do. Because God doesn't want, if it's grudgingly given, then you don't give it at all. Because God makes it clear in his word, what kind of giving is God like? God loves a cheerful giver. If we have some cheerful givers today and you would like to give to God, then we'll show you the ways you could do that. Those who have Cash App, you can make your donations to dollar sign Shiloh, B-C-G-S-O. Secondly, for those of you who are old school and you want to write a check, then make it payable to Shiloh Baptist Church, and you may address it, your envelope, to 1210 South Eugene Street, Greensboro, North Carolina. Our zip code is 27406. Thirdly, for those of you who are worshiping here with us today and you brought your, your tithes and offerings with you, you may deposit it in the basket as you leave. And then fourthly, uh, for those of you who would like to just bring it and hand deliver it, just give us a call at the church office, let us know you're coming, and then we will gladly come outside and receive it from you. Uh, we're looking forward to the days and the times when we will be able to worship together, resume our live worship services. Right now, we're looking forward, hopefully, weather permitting to an outdoor service on the first Sunday in April uh, in the Shiloh Park. Amen. We'll go outside back to the park and we will praise God and uh, have communion outside on the first Sunday in April. That's April the 3rd, y'all. And on the second Sunday in April, God be willing, we will come back into the church building for our live worship service and we'll continue to stream. For those of you who are far and would still prefer to, to watch it from the comfort of your homes, we will do that each and every Sunday. But on April the 10th, which is the 130th anniversary of Shiloh Baptist Church. We were founded on April 10th, 1892. To God be the glory for the great things that he has done. And we want you to come and worship with us on that great Sunday as we lift the roof off. We're going to praise God like we just out of our minds. And we're going to just thank him for what God has done. But it is on the beginning of our 130th anniversary. We'll celebrate our 130th anniversary the rest of this year uh, due to the impact of COVID. Uh, but we look forward to what God will allow us to do in this uh, 130th year as a uh, people of faith. And then, of course, uh, we invite you to stay connected with us each and every week. We pray every day at 730 in the morning. You can see how to join us on your screen. You can join us via Zoom as well. And if you don't see that on the screen, then you can call the church office. We will send you the link. Just let us know. We'll email you the Zoom link. But we want you to pray with us uh, when you will and if you can. And then secondly, of course, we invite you to connect with us on Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock via Zoom. Uh, you can see the number you can dial in if you don't have uh, Zoom download to your computer or to your smartphone. But we are studying the five-star church, and this is a, a great study because, believe it or not, the premise, the major thesis of the book is serving God's people and serving God and God's people with excellence. We were just preached about that today, serving God with excellence. So that means probably next Sunday uh, I will be preaching serving God <laughs> with excellence. How about that? So we can bring this thing full circle. And uh, we just want you to be a part of this great Bible study. If you're a church member, if you are a church leader, and all of you are church leaders in one way or another, then you should be a part of this very important Bible study. Won't you come and join with us as we see what God is doing uh, in this present moment as he propels Shiloh forward to be a greater church in the 21st century. You know, some churches, when they try to improve, they change the name. <laughs> they go from being that to Shiloh to greater Shiloh. We don't want to change our name. We just want to be that church. And so won't you come and join with us? All hearts and minds are clear. Uh, we invite you to stay with us for our communion service as we will celebrate communion in just a second.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've allowed us to come to another Communion Sunday, God. When we come together as a body in Christ, and we come, God, in remembrance of the sacrifice that was made for us on Calvary, how one who lived among us was willing to humble himself, was willing to put aside his own will, his own desires for what his life might be, God, but yet to be obedient to your will, God. And so he willingly offered himself as a living sacrifice so that we might be reconciled with you, God, and so that we might be able to live and have life eternally. So we come, God, and we ask that you would bless us that you would draw us closer together one by one, day by day, second by second, and hour by hour, till there should not be any division among us, that we should be all on one cord, God, and that we would be obedient to your will and your way. God, if there's anything in us and among us, God, that ought not be, we pray that you remove it from us, God. If there's any ill feeling, any hard feelings, any grudge or aught that we may have with one another, God, then let us go from this communion table, uh, come back another Sunday, uh, having reconciled with our brother and our sister, so that we may be one in you. We thank you, God, that we have a unity, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And we thank you, God, that we are one body in Christ. And so now, God, as we come to break this bread and to drink this blood, we ask that you would bless each of these. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord Jesus, the same night in which he's betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let us do the same. Let us eat together in Jesus' name. After the same manner, also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, ye do, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Let us drink. Amen. And amen. And then, of course, as Jesus, after Jesus, now this is this is this just blows our mind. You, we can't grasp this. Jesus does this at his last supper. He he knows he's going to be betrayed. Uh, Judas is is already <laughs> leaving, going out to betray Jesus. And you know what he says? He says, "Let's go and sing a song." He goes up to Mount Olives, and they go together. Because, you know, when it's not about you, you can sing and shout because you know the victory is already won. So can we sing together with that say, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms.
praise be to God.